Today I'm starting a new series entitled Maximizing Your Faith. Everybody say Maximizing Your Faith. If you've been a believer for any length of time, I'm pretty sure and probably know that you know how important faith is. However, I've discovered as a pastor that just because you know how important something is, it's different from understanding that thing. In other words, you can know that if you turn off the lights or turn them on, when you turn that switch, the lights are gonna come on, but that doesn't mean you understand what it takes to make the lights work. And so as believers, we've all been given faith through Jesus Christ, but most Christians, in my opinion, don't understand what faith is or how to make faith work. So my goal in this series, and it's gonna be probably maybe six weeks or so, my goal in this series is threefold. Number one, to help you understand what faith is. Number two, to help you know what faith can do. And number three, to show you how faith works. Now, I want to encourage you up front, touch your neighbor and say, pay attention. I want to encourage you up front to not miss any of these teachings. And here's why, it's for two reasons. Number one, I will be teaching faith in a systematic way, which means it's going to be line upon line and precept upon precept. And if you miss some lessons, it can slow down or fracture your understanding of how faith works. In other words, when you and I were in high school and we had to take algebra, if you miss three weeks of algebra, you're going to flunk that test when it comes. Amen. So I want to encourage you to not miss any of the teachings. Now, here's a second reason. Although you may be able to listen to the podcast, you may be able to go and listen to the CD, or you can go online and watch the YouTube uh, on the computer, it's not the same when you are in an environment of faith and when the Spirit of God is moving, it's not the same. So uh, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to be using a lot of Scripture. So just touch your neighbor and say, he's going to use a lot. I'm using a lot of Scripture because... The Word of God is the only thing that produces faith when we hear it. Amen. And God's Word is more important and is more powerful than my Word. So I'm going to use some Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, find Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17, and we're going to start in verse 17. Matthew 17, 17. And then we're going to move over to Matthew chapter 19, and we'll start in verse 23. That was Matthew 17, 17, and then Matthew 19, 23. Now, the first thing I want to point out about faith is how powerful it can be. Now, we're going to read a story here because this story points out how powerful faith is. Now, it's about a man who had a crazy son. How many got some crazy kids? No, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> this man had a crazy son. And sometimes as believers... We're dealing with spiritual issues in natural ways. So in this situation, this man had a crazy son, so we're gonna pick up the story because this man brought his crazy son to the disciples and the disciples could not heal this boy. So in verse 17 it says, then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I suffer you? Bring him to me. And Jesus, watch this, he rebuked the devil. Notice now, notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't rebuke the boy. He rebuked the devil. Amen. He didn't whoop the boy. You can't whoop a devil out of a person. Now, I believe in whooping. He rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Watch verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Watch now. Jesus is about to answer their question why they couldn't cast this devil out of this boy. And Jesus said to him, to them, because of your what? Because of your unbelief. Unbelief is just as powerful as faith. Unbelief is so powerful that if you have it running in your system, it will not allow faith to work. And some people wonder why their faith of what God wants to do in their life is not working. Maybe it's because your system is full of unbelief. He said, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, watch this now, if you have what? 
Come on, say that again. If you have what? Come on, if you have what? Okay, so we see now that the solution to unbelief and the solution to this problem was faith. He says, if you have faith, even as a grain of a mustard seed, you'll be able to say to the mountain, be removed to yonder place, and it shall be removed. Read this part with me. And nothing shall be impossible with you. Read it again. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. So I want to read this verse like this. If you have faith, Nothing shall be un, uh, impossible to you. In fact, say this with me. Say, if I have faith, I have faith. nothing will be impossible to me. Yeah. Come on, let's say that again. If I have faith, I have faith. nothing shall be impossible to me. Yeah. Now look at your neighbor and say, if you have faith, yeah. nothing will be impossible to you. Yeah. Are you hearing what that is saying? See, this eliminates issues now. This eliminates my, my educational level. Unless you have programmed inside of you your level of education being where you go in life, then of course, hey, it's not possible. He's saying, when I learn how to use faith, things that were impossible becomes possible. Amen. So faith makes the impossible possible. Say this with me. Say faith makes the impossible possible. Now look in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, they're going to put it on the screen, verse 23. Now this verse shows us again the power behind faith. It says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into, into the kingdom of God. Now, let me just explain this because we're talking about some custom things here. Now, when he talks about the eye of the needle and a camel going through, let me just start out by saying he didn't say rich people couldn't go to heaven. He said it's just hard for them. Why? Because rich people tend to rely on their wealth and their riches. So he said it's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Well, what does that mean? Back in those days, remember now, they used to be surrounded by walls. At nighttime, they, they had these walls that was pretty much like a, 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 a shape like this. And it was set up where they couldn't be attacked by their enemies in a major way. They would shut down every other entrance. And only at night, you can get through this small door. And the only way you could get in is if you came in and you had a camel that was full of stuff, you would have to unload the camel. And then the only way the camel could get through this door or the eye of the needle is to get down on all four. And I don't know if you've ever seen this. And he had to crawl through that door. That's what Jesus was saying. It's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to come into the kingdom of God. So watch what he says now. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. They say, who then could be? saved so watch this now if all the disciples were broke men why would they react that way it said they were amazed now see I know culturally we were probably taught in an un uh, in, an, in a traditional way that you know Jesus was broke and all of his disciples well you have to understand most of his disciples were entrepreneurs Peter, James, and John, they were fishermen. They had their own businesses. Hello. Luke was a physician. We know, based on our healthcare system, the doctors are making some money. Right? They were amazed and said, well, who can be saved? And then Jesus said unto them, read it with me. With men, this is impossible. But with God, stop right there. How many? How many? All things are what? Okay, so watch this. He says, if you're going to count on men, whatever you're believing for is not going to be possible. But if you put God in the equation, all things now becomes possible. Which now tells me that whatever I'm believing God for and believing God to do, the moment my trust shifts over to man is the moment that possible situation becomes impossible. And many of us, we put our faith in people. It's quiet in here now, ain't it? 
We put our faith in their promises. We put our faith in what they said they would do. We put our faith in what their positions are. But listen, Jesus said, with men, it's impossible. But with God, how many things? So I don't have to be qualified for this job to get it. I'm going to say that on this side. I don't have to be qualified for the job to get it. All of my body functions don't have to be functioning the way the doctor feels they should for me to get what I want. Listen, Landon, Landon, our eight-year-old son, is proof that this scripture works. See, at one point, Pastor Sarah, I know she's a powerful woman of God. Let me say it like the old school. She's a powerful woman of God. But Pastor Sarah's confidence at one point was in the doctors and in their reports. But see, the moment her confidence shifted from the doctor to the great physician, she started getting some results. See, with men, it's impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things become possible. And see, the facts told us medically we couldn't have a kid. The facts told us that things weren't working right. And see, I never let that bother me. I never wavered in the process. It's not that I'm just this great man of God, but first of all, I had already done this before. I had a, I had a 10-year-old to prove it at the time. Heaven was 10. I said, if I can do it once, I can do it again. When the doctor sat us down and he went over all the information and uh, he, she wasn't ovulating and, and she had eggs, but they weren't falling out of the nest. <laughs> then he said, well, your husband is supposed to have 20 million sperm. He only have two. Well, I'm a tither in every area of my life. <laughs> Y'all are so slow this morning. Y'all are slow. <laughs> he said, it, we, we require at least two billion sperm. Well, all it takes in my mind is one. So I looked at that doctor, and, I, and he told us, well, how much, he, he's, I said, well, how much is it going to cost? He said, well, it's going to cost about $10,000, and, and it's not guaranteed it's going to work. So it'll be 10000 per try. And my wife was looking at me like, write the check, man. I said, uh, I said I'll tell you what, babe. We're going to give the 10000 to God. And I looked at the doctor and I said, I will see you on the other side of my faith. And now we have a eight-year-old son to prove what's impossible with man is possible with God. Can I get a hand clap from the Lord? Now here's the question, did the facts change? No. Did the doctor's report change? No. What changed was who Pastor Sire was putting her confidence in, amen. Now, faith has the ability to move mountains, and a mountain can represent any big issue in your life. And there are going to come some times in your life where you may be uh, looking at a big problem, and it's going to be up to you on how you respond to it, but faith has the ability to overcome mountains. And I love uh, uh, 1 John 5, it says, and this is the confidence that we have that whatever we ask God, he'll hear us. And then it tells us that faith overcomes the world. So listen now, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. If you'll put that on the screen, Matthew 17, verse 20. It says, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith, watch this, as the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to the mountain, remove hence to young the place, and it shall be removed. Watch this, and nothing shall be impossible with you. Everybody say nothing. Everybody say nothing. So if I learn how to use my faith, then the impossibilities of life become possible. So here's a legitimate question that I want you to write down. Here's a legitimate question. Who has faith? Who has faith? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The first part of that verse says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. So the context of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul was talking to Christians. Everybody say Christians. Paul was talking to Christians. He was talking to brothers in Christ. So then when we skip down to verse 3, 
It says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God, watch this, has given, has dealt, has issued to every man, watch this, the measure of faith. So God, when you got born again, God gave every believer the measure of faith. He gave everybody the same amount. Everybody say the same amount. He gave everybody the same amount. So the answer to the question, every believer has faith. When you made Jesus Lord, faith was deposited inside of your life, inside of your heart. And here's the misunderstanding of faith these days to me. I think most people think that the main purpose of their faith is for them to have a better life. But that's really not the main reason why you and I have faith. The main reason that you and I have faith is really to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 5, they can put it on the screen. It says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. In other words, this man had so much faith. He was walking with God. God decided, you know what? I don't even want him to die. I don't even want him to have a funeral. I'm just going to take him. Now, I hope you do me like that. So we don't have to worry about no funeral expenses. Y'all ain't got to worry about all that. Where did Pastor Abner go? He gone. Well, the scripture says Enoch got translated because God had translated him for before his translation. Watch this. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Watch verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So the main purpose of our faith is for us to use it to please God. It's not just to get some stuff. Stuff is okay. But that's not the main thing. See, really, our faith should be set up for us to, watch this, carry out the things that God puts in our heart. See, God has designed the faith that he's put inside of you. It's way bigger than what you think you can do. So now when people see things getting done, they say, oh, that couldn't have been Pastor Evan. That had to be God. See, that building we're building, that cannot be Pastor Evan. That cannot be Word of Truth Family Church. That is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. So now here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. I want you to see faith as a two-sided coin because I'm going to break faith down this morning. Because if you learn how to use it, because the scripture says we ought to live by faith. Well, how many hours a day do you live? 24. So that means I should have the ability to live by this faith that God's put inside of me 24 hours a day. So faith is a two-sided coin. On one side, everybody say on one side. On one side is believing, and on the other side is action. Now, next week and the week after, you don't want to miss it because I'm going to show you the difference between what believing is and what people mix up as faith. I'm going to be explaining believing next week. But I want you to see faith as a two-sided coin. On one side of the coin, you know how you have heads and tails. On one side, you have believing, and on the other side, you have action. So let's put faith in today's context. When Jesus taught back in his day, he used to use parables. And these parables were used to help people understand what actually he was trying to teach. Now, what's a parable? A parable is just an earthly example to help highlight and understand a spiritual meaning. So what I'm going to do, and so if you look back when he used like the parable of the talents, well, if he lived here physically, if he was physically here in the United States in 2018, it wouldn't have been called the parable of the talents. It would have been called the parable of the dollar bill. So what I'm going to do for you to help understand faith, I'm going to now do a parable in today's understanding for you to understand faith. Amen. So this is called a modern day parable. Touch your neighbor and say, pay attention right now. Now, we read over in Romans 3 that God had given every believer the measure of faith. So what that means, if you're a believer, you have faith. So now I want you to pretend, just for understanding's sake, that faith represents a car. How many know what a car is? If you know what a car is, raise your hand. If you know what a car is, okay. So we're going to pretend, for understanding's sake, that faith represents a car. Now, when you and I got saved, the Bible says God dealt 
given to every person the measure of faith. So now, since faith now represents a car, I want you to pretend when you got saved, God gave everybody a car. Look at your neighbor and say, I got a car. Now, you can figure in your mind what kind of car it is. I'm going to leave that up to you. You can have a Lamborghini. You can have a Volkswagen. Whatever it is, I want you to picture in your mind what kind of car you want that God has given you that represents faith. Now, listen to this now. Here's where the problem comes in because just because you haven't read the owner's manual for that car doesn't make it the manufacturer's fault. In other words, God has given us faith, but it's not his fault if we don't understand how to use it. And when he gave you that car, it is up to you and I to read the owner's manual. Hello, that's what this is. It's up to us to read it and get an understanding so we know how to function the car that he gave us. Are you with me so far? Now, here's the thing. You can have a perfectly working vehicle and choose to never drive it. There are some Christians. They have faith. They have a car. For some reason, they choose not to drive it. You can have a perfectly working car and decide you want a carpool. I'm going to ride in somebody else's car. I'm going to ride on somebody else's faith. Will you pray for me? Amen. You can keep it in the driveway and you can ride the bus to work. It's your car. It's up to you to do with what you want to. And see, most people shift the responsibility of the car working on God. But he said, oh, no, 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 no. I have given you faith. Now I need you to use it. So some of us, our car, our faith is parked in the driveway. Amen. But that does not mean your car doesn't work. It just means that you're not working your car. So look at your name and say, are you working your car? Now here's what makes things worse, is when some believers have been saved so long, they're just happy that they have a car. They don't even drive it. They just happy they got one. And those are people who always sing, they, you know, they, they are spiritually minded, they're no earthly good. They're always singing about going to heaven. And I'm gonna go to heaven, but I need, to, I don't wanna go through hell down here getting there. Amen. Here's what's sad. Remember now, faith is a two-sided coin. One of the sides is called action. Everybody say action. So you can have this perfectly running car, but it has to have something in it to work. It needs gasoline or this car is not going to work. The motor can be good. Your tires can be brand new. But if you do not put some gas in your car, your car is not going to work. If you don't know and put some action on your faith, your faith is not going to work. Faith without works is dead. And listen, and listen, it doesn't make sense. And see, some of us were like, well, God, I need you to put some gas in it. Well, he gave you the car. <laughs> now, James chapter 2, look in James chapter 2. It talks about Faith without works being dead. And I'm going to jump down to verse 17. Faith, uh, James chapter 2, verse 17. I'm wrapping up here. It says, even so faith, if it does not have works, what kind of faith is it? It's what? It's dead. Yes, if, if a man may say that I have faith, or he has faith and I have works, he says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You do well. But the devils also believe in trembling. But will you know, O vain man, that, read it with me, faith without, is what? Faith without what? Is what? Say it again. Faith without what? Works is what? Faith without works is dead. So a person can have faith. They can have a car. But if they don't put gas in it, that car is not going to run. You can pray. You can fast, you can, you can ask, you can start a prayer chain on Facebook. 
But if you don't put some action behind your faith, if you don't put some gas in that car, it's not going to run. And let me tell you how ridiculous this sounds. I mean, does it sound crazy to have a car in your driveway that needs gas and you expect the gas to get in it by itself? You wake up the next morning, you get in, turn the key, E. I thought some gas would be in here. So you shut the key off, you go to sleep, come back, get back in the car, turn the key, all the way over to E. Man, I thought gas would be in this car. So then you ask your, your, your neighbor to take you to work. You ride in their car, you ride on their fate. Then you come back the next morning, you put the key in the car, you turn the key. Now, would it be ridiculous for us to think the gas was going to get in the car by itself? So then it's just as ridiculous for us to expect God, watch this, to work our faith our, when he's already given it to us. It's not up to him anymore. Faith without is what? So guess whose who's responsibility is it to put works on the other side of faith? It's us. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to put some works behind it. So there are four things that I'm going to give you this morning that need to be active in order for your faith to be working. Four things, four things. If these four things are always working, your faith will always be active. See, I, I know when my faith is active because I know that these four things have to be in place. Here's the first thing. You must have works. We just read that. James 2.20 told us that. But I'm going to read an example of works in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. It says, and again, Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that Jesus was in the house. See, that's how you get a church to grow when Jesus is in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. In other words, Jesus was preaching in this house. Verse 3, it says, and they, they came unto him and they brought one that was sick of the palsy which was born of four and when they could not come near to him because of the crowd they uncovered the roof where he was and when they had broken up the roof they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay watch verse 5 I want you to read it with me when Jesus what he what he saw the foot which means now that if my faith is working, you should see something. If your faith is working, you should see something. Say this with me. If my faith is working, somebody ought to see something. So if you sit there and you ask, you know, you want a new job and you've not had one application, you don't even have an updated, your resume got spider webs on it. <laughs> You have to have some works behind your faith. Here's number two. You must speak faith-filled words. I'm talking about four things that have to be active for your faith to be at work. Number one, you have to have what behind it? You have to have works behind it. Number two, you must speak faith-filled words. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So listen, if, if the word must be heard, somebody must be saying it. So you and I, for our faith to be working, we must be speaking faith-filled words. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life is in the power of our tongue. And whatever you like is what you're going to eat. So what I want to see in life is produced by what I say or what I say produces what I see. So listen, if you want your faith working all the time, see, this is why some people's faith is on the shelf. Because they don't know that these four things have to be working all the time. See, when you drive a car, your motor have to work, your transmission have to work, you have to have gas in the car, you have to have some tires on your wheels, right? If all of those things are working, your car is going to work. Well, these four things have to be active all the time in order for faith to be working in your life. You have to speak faith-filled words. Mark chapter 11, verse 23 says, for verily I say unto you, this was Jesus talking, whosoever shall say unto the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe, I'm talking about that next week, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, watch this, he shall have, watch this, whatsoever he would. It didn't say he will have whatever he thinks. 
Because most of us, we think we're praying, we're just thinking. He didn't say you're going to have what you think. He said you're going to have what you were. See, so your faith is not active if you're not saying nothing. He said, well, pastor, what I need to be saying? Pastor, I want to be married. I feel you. I feel you. I feel you. You want to get married. What should I be saying, pastor? Well, let me start out by saying what you shouldn't be saying. I ain't going to never get married. My husband must be on Mars because he sure ain't down here. That's what you should not be saying. Well, what did you say? Well, Pastor, what, I, what should I be saying as a single person if I want to get married? Well, you wake up in the morning and you declare, Father, I thank you that my spouse will be right when I need them. I thank you for them right now. That, Father, they are exactly what I need. They fit me in every way, and they're going to love me if he's a man. He's going to love me like Christ loves the church. And if it's a lady, you can say, Father, she's going to be just like a Proverbs 31 woman. And, Father, my children will praise her. See, see, you're talking like you're married. Now, I ain't talking about be acting crazy now where, you know, you, you don't wear a ring on your wedding ring hand if you're not married. Don't do that because you, you, you're distracting people. They need to know that you're single. Okay? And if you're married... That'll keep a lot of them away. You got to talk. You got to speak faith-filled words. Here's number three. You must hear the word to get pregnant with the word. See, most people, they hear the word one day a week. I have a, a, ver, a, 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 a whole sermon that my pastor did years ago. And my goal is to listen to it once a day, every day. Find your favorite, ver uh, or your favorite sermon that I've done in your life and play it once a day. Listen, play it. Play it. Play it. Play it, play it, play it. That's the only way you get unbelief out. You need, some of y'all need a spiritual enema. See, you push unbelief out when you put in belief. Well, how do you put belief in? You put the word in. So listen, the third thing you have to do, you must hear the word. And that's why I say faith comes by hearing. And if you go to Luke chapter 1, I'm not going to read everything. I'm going to jump down. Uh, Mary, the angel came to Mary, told Mary she was going to have a son. She says, how's that going to happen? And so let's pick it up now in verse uh, 34. Then said the Mary to the angel, how shall this be seeing that I know not a man? How can I get this job and I'm not qualified for it? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost has come on you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she's also conceived a son in her old age. Watch this now. This is good. And she's in her sixth month, who was called barren. Verse 37, for with God, for with God, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And then Mary said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. Watch this, what she says. Be it unto me according to your word. What got Mary pregnant? The word did. Listen, the angel spoke what God said. She heard the word. She received the word. She believed the word. She conceived the word. See, you got to hear that word because, see, you never know when pregnancy is going to happen. It takes sometimes more than one time to get pregnant. Sometimes you have to practice. Married people, it is legal to practice. Okay? Yeah. So, I got one amen right over here, okay. <laughs> no, no. When you're try how many have tried to have a kid before? Okay, how I many anybody tried to have kids before? That's all? We got all those kids back in there and back and that's all the kids? <laughs> oh, so they all accidents. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Now listen. 
for the most part, for the most part, you didn't get pregnant on the first try. And see, when it comes to faith, you got to hear the word because you don't know when you're going to get pregnant. You don't know when that, when you don't know when that word is going to hit your spirit and boom, belief's going to start. So you got to hear the word. You got to receive the word. And then here's the last one. You must learn how to believe the word, which is the other side of the faith coin, which is what I'm going to go and deal with next week. So here's your homework assignment today. Here's your homework assignment. Everybody say homework. So, Pastor, I'm already in school. I ain't come to church to get no homework. Well, you need some homework. First thing I want you to do when you get home, I want you to write down three things that you know God has told you to do or whatever promise God has given you or whatever desires you have in your heart. I want you to write down three of those desires or promises or whatever he told you to do. Then I want you to list in a column the actions you are currently doing to bring that promise to pass. Because faith without work is what? Okay, so I want you to write down the things you are currently doing. And then I want you to get another column and write down the things that you should be doing. Okay, so you say, well, Pastor Evan, what do you mean? See, when you're in faith, you would do things that you know you should be doing. See, if you're in faith to, to better your health, why are you still eating stuff that gets you sick? Oh, oh, but you want God to heal you. Let me tell you what would happen. If you still stuck on those water burgers, you know water burger ain't good for you. But, you, but it tastes good. So you eating your water burgers and it's making you sick and then God supernaturally heals you and you get healed. Because you're addicted to those water burgers, you're going to go back and eat them again. Amen. So you're going to list the actions or the works that you're currently doing, and then you're going to list the ones that you're not doing. And then next week, everybody say next week. I want you to bring it with you because here's the thing. Faith without works is dead. When, I, when we step out to start our church to be constructed, we didn't have all the money. If you wait to have everything God wants you to have to do what God wants you to do, you will never do what God wants you to do because it's never according to your riches and glory. It's always according to his. See, when God tells you to do something, it's not based. He don't check out your resources before he wants you to, oh, well, they can do it. They got enough money. That's not how he works. What he does, because see, the only way, if you got all the money, you know who's going to get the glory? You. So you know what he does? He puts things in our hearts. He puts positions in our lives. See, some of, there's some people in this room today, you're struggling because you, you got a job and you feel like it's over your head. It, it might be over your head, but it's not over his. And all the wisdom and all the knowledge and everything that you need to perform in that position, if you'll just trust in the Lord and all your heart and lean out to your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge him, he will show you how to run that office. Did y'all get something out of the word today? Amen.